Um, the next session is going to be about choice and control. The organisation I work for um, is across aged care, disability, mental health, working with refugees, veterans care. So we have quite a broad perspective and I think it's particularly interesting um, and something that we should be thinking about is looking at the parallels in the aged care sector, um, who are, who ha which has been going through a, a fairly serious process of reform towards consumer-directed care, where the funds are held by the consumer. Um, the whole sector has had to restructure towards the consumer as the customer, has had to refocus towards person-centred care. Um, and I think that's a great place to look when we're thinking about the NDIS and how it can work for people with a lived experience. In particular, one of the concerns I have about the NDIS is about um, the assessment process and the planning process. We know, and other non-profits know, particularly the ones that have been, uh, you know, have long histories working with people with a lived experience of mental illness, uh, know that it takes trust, it takes relationships, and it takes time. Um, and I think if you ask any consumer whether they think uh, a government organisation, which you might parallel with Centrelink, has that ability, there might be some questions there. So I think outsourcing those assessments will be something the sector needs to think about. That said, we'll be looking forward to hearing about choice and control from our upcoming speakers. The first speaker is Dr Lisa Brophy. She's the Director of Research with Mind Australia. Dr Brophy is uh, a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Mental Health, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, University of Melbourne. She has a career-long commitment to the mental health field of practice. As Director of Research at MIND, Lisa has developed and is implementing MIND's research and evaluation framework focused on recovery and social inclusion. Her role is resulting in embedding a research culture in mind, as well as engaging in multiple collaborative research partnerships. Please join me in making her welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. And uh, thank you to everyone who stayed on for uh, Friday afternoon. I really appreciate it. And uh, um, Rachel, um, oopsie daisy. You right? That's okay. Um, thank you for um, your acknowledgement of country and I won't repeat that but I share your sentiments so thank you very much. And I also want to thank the conference organisers for inviting me to speak. It's, it's wonderful and um, having an opportunity to share this research that um, I'm just going to wing it for a while now um, that, <laughs> that we did um, in the Barwon region in 2013. So um, this was at a time before um, the NDIS was um, was getting started, but it was this work was commissioned by Mind Australia in the context of wanting to um, investigate what if people really had a choice, what would they actually ask for? So we're really, and uh, I feel like I'm going to impose death by PowerPoint on you, and I'm sorry about that. I I think as a researcher, you get this problem where you. you you fall in love with your data and you think everybody's going to be interested in all of it and then you don't know how to cull it. But I've left it all in there, but there's lots of quotes in, in this presentation that I won't read out all of them, but um, you'll have an opportunity if you download the presentation to have a look. And certainly I hope you'll go to the main report, which is now available on the Mind Australia uh, research webpage and you can read a lot more um, that our participants said. So first of all, I'd like to say that this research project wouldn't have been possible without the people who are listening on this slide, and in particular um, Michael Stiliano and um, Nadine Cox, who were the consumer researchers involved, and I'll, um, I'll get to them as, uh, later. And of course, as I said, mind funding the, this, um, this work, and all the participants and people who helped um, to enable this, and that was the agencies and people on the advisor group, advisory group, so it was terrific. And I wish uh, some of my colleagues were here today with me, but unfortunately no one was able to um, co-present today. So why do this research? It was really uh, in the context of um, the NDIS, which we're all talking about, um, but the issue of choice and control is also represented in government policy and really in um, the shift to the recovery movement as well. Um, and we were very interested in engaging consumers and talking about their perspective. And this really puts the findings in a unique position because we've talked a lot about what consumers are saying over the last two days, but this is actually now captured in research that we can publish and engage in a whole lot of knowledge dissemination activities around. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for um, government to really hear about that. So as I said, we're asking people about their support needs and preferences um, and we're wanting to involve um, consumers in the research at all, at all levels. And um, my initial intention or our initial intention with this research was really to support innovation as well. So not only knowing what people might want but also informing the sector in relation to 
where's the opportunity for innovation if we hear more from, um, from consumers? And also um, the degree to which that might contribute to efforts to engage in co-design or co-production. So the overarching research question was when given a choice and based on their personal preferences, what supports do people with psychosocial disability think they need to have a good life? And I can understand that some people might, be a bit, might feel a bit contested about that good life concept, but it's certainly emerging in the literature. And, um, and we were guided um, by a literature review which suggested that asking people about a good life is actually <coughs> a good way to start these conversations. Um, and we also gave people an opportunity, a participatory sort of way to, to actually, we had a 10 seeds technique and people could actually allocate their funding um, using the 10 seeds. But I'm not going to go into how they allocated their funding today, I haven't got time, but you can see that in the research. So we, we watched and, and participated in people making decisions about their preferences as well. And it was really a way to encourage people to use their imagination and not be, and not be bound by what's currently offered or um, <coughs> what they already know something about, but um, really, if they could really do it, what would they actually really want? Um, and so, um, we were really guided, everybody's been talking about um, the importance of recovery in the context of mental health service delivery, and we were guided by that too in terms of, um, this is the CHIME framework, which gives you a nice summary of where people are coming from when they think about our recovery focus, and this was, um, taking a recovery focus to research methods. So um, for us that meant the involvement of consumers in a reference group and an advisory group, having a project advisory group and having um, interviews conducted um, by consumer researchers as well. So they weren't able to conduct all, all of the interviews, but they, um, they did conduct um, some and they had opportunities to comment on all of our data. Um, so they were involved in, in the collection, in the development of the research questions, in the development of the, the method and design of the, of the research and then involved in analysis and now we're all involved in writing, um, which is very important for us because we have to get published. Um, so this is this idea of um, representing that recovery oriented approach in research. So we were lucky enough to, to be able to recruit 41 participants from the Barwon region. We deliberately did the research in Barwon because um, we anticipated that people would have a bit more literacy about these issues of choice and control and uh, with, with the NDIS coming. And we um, and I think that was, that was pretty true when I read the transcripts. I think people had heard a bit about the NDIS and they heard that they might have these opportunities in the future. So um, all of the people we recruited um, we're currently either um, receiving services from the clinical service or from um, community managed mental health support services in, in the Barwon region. And probably this profile that you're seeing in front of you wouldn't be that unusual. We've got an older group of people, um, very much in their middle years. Um, just one thing I wanted to, you can see how many people live alone um, and or in supported housing, which was very high. Um, in terms of employment status, it's kind of interesting that only 23 actually said they were unemployed. But that's a bit of a, um, be careful with that figure because um, the vast majority, well over 95% of people were on the DSP. So. Um, what, we, what people was, were saying was that they were sort of reluctant to say they were unemployed because they had little bits of work here and there, or it may have been just in the pro a problem in the data collection. But I think the most important thing is that most people were on the, on the DSP and relying on that for, um, for, for funding. So we were interested in whether people even thought what psychosocial disability and do they kind of relate to that idea? Now this definition you'll see is based on the National Mental Health Care and Consumer Forum and the NDIS rules. It's a shortened version because the Ethics Committee saw the longer version and said you can't say that to people in a research project. Make it shorter. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and it was interesting that you can see that 38 of our 41 participants agreed that this was something that they could relate to, which was an interesting finding in itself. And some people were a bit reluctant to talk about that and they thought the problems were really in the environment around them, but they sort of agreed that they had issues and problems associated with mental health. And so we felt that that was enough to get them across the line in terms of eligibility. So in terms of eligibility, not for our research, but the NDIS, this is what we are. We asked people whether they thought that they might be eligible for the NDIS, and I think these findings are kind of interesting, that mm, some of them said yes, some of them said, oh, I don't, I hope so. 
Um, I don't know. Um, and some of them were pretty definite that they wouldn't be. Um, but <coughs> you can see that comment about people being quite nervous about whether they were indeed going to be eligible. And this was early days, of course, but um, a lot of people must be sitting with these concerns, mustn't they? Um, so, of course, we've talked about fluctuations. So um, we'd anticipated that fluctuations was going to, going to be an issue. So we asked people about um, whether they thought there was any sort of permanency about um, their problems. And you can see here that it's kind of interesting that th a third, a third, a third, I don't want to reinforce that, but it's interesting that we have this um, group of people who a third of them definitely thought that they'd be, they'd be in, in the position that they're in now for an extended period of time, where other people thought that they'd be fluctuating. And, and again, um, quite a few um, expected to, um, for things to change over time. So, yeah. unfortunately in our report we didn't even um, get an opportunity to write this up, um, but I wanted to share with you, with you and, I'm, and my intention is to actually go back to the data and do a lot more work about what people said in response to this overarching question of a good life. But if you look at those themes there and you look at the literature, they are so incredibly consistent with what um, is recorded elsewhere and people who would be uh, familiar with the work the National Mental Health Commission has done around a contributing life and um, in the intellectual disability space as well. These are very common themes about the kinds of things that people are saying um, is, um, is a good life to them. So that consistency I think is really important and I think again um, there's a gap in the, in the literature around um, what people with, um, with um, enduring mental health issues are saying about a good life and uh, hopefully we'll write that up a bit more. Sorry I'm racing through this but uh, I'm just, oh, sorry this is, hasn't got my, got, got a slide. This is my old version. Oh that's okay, we'll just have to manage. Um, we'll just have to manage, sorry. Uh, I that's my mistake, sorry, I had to change my, my slides and, um, and uh, they haven't been changed there, but it's, it's my fault, I've put it on the wrong list. That's okay. Um, we'll change it back to the old one later and we'll ask people to download that one. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we asked people about their domains and um, I just the slide that you're missing is a slide that actually talks about the 14 domains that we came up with from the literature and in those 14 and those 14 domains we had prompt cards that actually helped people to think about what those domains actually were um, and in those um, in those domains uh, we saw that um, we had for example, I'll give you living skills, was at the bottom. Um, only 12% of people thought that living skills were something that was a, uh, a goal in relation to having a good life. Um, family was something that we actually didn't have a prompt card for. And the reason why we didn't have a prompt court card for that was because it wasn't in the Chime and it wasn't in the Kansas and it wasn't in the literature as something that you would put as a domain, but um, participants in our study actually created family as a domain. They also put it into personal relationships, which we're going to talk about later, but many people wanted just to keep that separated out and they created that domain, um, which I think is very important. But now we're just coming to this top five. So when we think about the, the top five uh, life goals, we, um, we see that we have this um, emphasis on health, um, economic goals, social connection, housing and personal life. Now you see that support person is in there and uh, this is where I say, well, we're researchers, we make mistakes. Support person, we put it in as a, as a goal, but in fact, um, even though lots of people felt that having a support person was a goal for them in life, um, when we looked at the qualitative data, it seemed more appropriate to be shifting that out to being um, something that was more of an, an enabler, and we'll get to that in a little while. So when we think about the top five, the first one is health. So in relation to health, we have um, people talking about an integrated view of health. So um, there was, um, people really didn't seem to want to make a distinction a lot of the time between their mental and physical health and saw that as very integrated. And you'll see that um, 
the kinds of supports that people really wanted in relation to health um, included both mental, mental health support and physical health support and, and the kinds of things that were actually more focused on wellbeing. And I've highlighted peer support here because that's just one example of, um, of an area where peer support was mentioned as a, as a top priority for support. The other area that um, isn't listed there but is important and was mentioned earlier this morning is dental. So a lot of people were talking about how they'd like to somehow subsidise their access um, to health supports that they currently couldn't get because of um, the interaction with the next um, goal, which was um, economic goals. So we were, prof we were profoundly affected by how um, much people that we, we were interviewing were dealing with poverty, um, even to the point where some people were um, on controlled eating regimes um, because of um, problems with their income and the ina inadequacy of the, of the DSP. So there was lots of um, ideas that participants had about training and skill development and employment assistance. Um, getting a job, not just what the agency offers, was a really important issue for them. Lots of people um, had had certificates and had done some training, but their frustration was that they that it actually hadn't led to a job. Um, some people were, were further frustrated by the idea that, sorry, um, so, so I thought somebody was. Um, somebody, some people were further frustrated about the idea that because they'd done some training, they weren't now eligible to be subsidised for other training that would actually lead to a job. So um, they were feeling very stuck in not being able to get the kind of support they needed. But you can see that quote sort of talks about the idea that it wasn't just about getting a job; it was just about even trying to manage on the income that they actually had now, because um, things were it was so difficult. So some financial uh, advice and support. So social connection was a very important um, issue and most of our participants were profoundly lonely. Um, I'm sure that's not um, any surprise to any of you. And they all, that many of them, uh, as you can see, recognised this as a priority area for them to achieve some change. Um, the many people just weren't quite sure how they would actually spend sort of funds on social connection. It was it was an area that um, not a lot of them actually necessarily put their funds into. But um, these are the kinds of um, of areas that people thought that um, were important. So peer support and peer support groups um, were very important. And um, and you can see that the range of kind of things that we might expect that people would be trying to do to sort of stop being so lonely. Um, Sorry, that's I didn't need the slide for it, but that, there it is. That's the um, the issues around peer support, and peer support groups. Um, the next area was housing. So um, no surprise that people couldn't ignore that um, that they had major housing problems, and um, people prioritised this as a goal as well. Um, and I think they linked housing a lot to the kind of goals that we've discussed so far, that if they had stable housing then perhaps their economic situation would improve, they wouldn't feel so lonely um, and their health might even improve as well. So these are the kinds of supports that people talked about in relation to, to housing. Um, and I think moving and relocating is a really interesting one. Lots of people talked about moving and relocating because they'd found that so disruptive and it also had set them back financially quite a lot. Um, and, no, and none of them knew how they would actually get support for something like relocating, but it was, um, it was an issue that was raised by a number of people. So now we get to intimate relationships and family relationships, which was kind of where this... Um, this there was a bit of a confluence of issues under this over, overarching topic of um, personal relationships. But I, I want to emphasise that people wanted to separate out, separate out the idea that intimate relationships is one thing, family relationships is another thing, social connection and making friends is another thing, and I need help in all three of those areas. So these are the kinds of things that people thought um, might enable um, improvements in um, their uh, personal life. So um, people had no idea about how to get, get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but gee, they really, or, or, or whatever, but they really wanted um, that. And if they could use some um, funding to help them achieve that, then that would be a big priority for them. And you can see a number of other ideas about how family members could be supported. 
people were really aware of barriers to achieving um, their good life goals. They, um, and without any prompting from us, stigma and discrimination was um, an extraordinary issue uh, for our participants and came up uh, because we discussed barriers in relation to all of their um, life goal areas. And you can see that this clever way of mapping um, what came up in those conversations um, tells you how much stigma, financial issues um, and discrimination represent you know, quite significant barriers for people. But also the impact of actually having uh, mental health issues and um, the kinds of, um, of, of products of being so isolated and, and so forth, all the kinds of things that we've discussed so far. But the good thing also was that people were very aware of what enabled change and what they thought would actually assist them. And again, you can see with this slide how um, some things kind of jump out at you. And the things that come jump, jump out, of me, at, out at me in relation to this is really about um, family. And people sort of could see that having better connections with their family, having more support from their family, would often might actually be a way of... Um, of enabling lots of other things to fall into place. And I'll just remind you though that most of these people weren't actually living with their family. They were living alone or they were living in some kind of supported residential service. So what we, what we found was that lots of people had actually lost their connections with their family or they kind of burnt bridges with their families. And so they were actually asking for potential opportunities to work at how to rebuild my connections with those people. In fact, one heartbreaking comment was that somebody suggested that he'd like to have funding to go and visit his mother's grave because it would just be a really nice opportunity to feel connected to someone even though she'd passed away and he'd never actually gone to visit her grave because it was in Melbourne and he was living down in Geelong. I've only got five minutes to go and I've got so much more to tell you. Okay, well, this is um, support person um, as a key enabler and, you know, what people were saying is that I need a support person and I need, and it, this harks back to so many of the presentations yesterday, Kaz and Healy in particular, I think, the idea that I don't want just any kind of support person. I want a support person who really knows what they're doing. Um, and they need to understand what it's like to have the kind of mental health issue that I've got. And they need to understand the impact of psychosocial disability. And you can see that people, and again, this wasn't prompted by us in any kind of way. And I'm a social worker. I've got a social work background. It looks like a social work text, you know, in terms of the kinds of um, roles and responsibilities and uh, skills that they're saying that people should have. And it goes on, the next page, the kinds of uh, characteristics that people are looking for. Um, it's, you know, and it's probably psychology 101, OT 101. Um, and it, but on the other hand, people didn't necessarily expect that this had to be a professional person. And many people liked the idea of having a peer support worker who was um, a highly skilled person and uh, could see that lived experience would give them those skills. Um, and potentially other people could be um, part of their... Um, uh, you know, even potentially supported to be a support person for them, so a family member or a friend who they thought had the skills to be able to, um, to do the kinds of things that they thought a support person needed. Um, so as I said, we've, we see this phenomenon where family um, was not only an enabler, but also for some people a main life goal. Um, and yet, you know, we also see this kind of not really well represented in things like the CHIME framework. Um, and also, even in Kansas, for example, that, which was another thing that we'd relied on to come up with those domains that I talked about, it's not actually a domain in Kansas. Um, so I think, in a way, because we... In a, we were, it, this was a, a rather naive project, you know, we, we wanted to think about how do we have these conversations with people, what's going to help us have a really good conversation with people about their goals. Um, we learned some things about the things that we should have put in, the things we should have put out, the things we could have put in another, the, the way we could have organised things to, to actually really capture it. But it does, it does tell you something about um, putting effort into these kinds of conversations. And just to build on that, there's a whole lot of quotes there about all the kinds of things that people were talking about that family could contribute to in relation to helping these people um, gain a good life or the, the kinds of things that family were doing already. Um, so stigma and discrimination, the barriers to achieving um, 
priority um, life goals. It was so incredibly well represented. And this also sits very well with other studies that you may be aware of. The, um, the big national um, survey of um, people with psychosis, um, again, people were talking about stigma and discrimination. And we also kind of captured a lot of self-stigma, I think. And this is so important when we're thinking about people being potentially um, going off to, um, oh, for want of a better word, mainstream kind of service delivery environments. You know, we were talking about men's shed last night or the local um, uh, you know, uh, activity program. If people are facing stigma and discrimination in those sort of contexts, they're probably not going to go. Uh, and they know when they when they see it, and there uh, and we we really saw, and people knew that that was going to be a big barrier for them, even if they had uh, funding and opportunities to do things. And poverty and financial issues was, of course, another important thing. And I think that's a very sad comment at the bottom there that someone not being able to go to a wedding um, in the family because of um, the difficulty that they would have about buying a present or um, actually participating in the wedding. Um, and I think that needs to be the kind of thing that if we're having conversations with people about a good life, we need to be thinking about those so social and structural forces that people are facing. I think this is a fascinating finding. We ask people, do you need help with decision making? No, I know what I want. I know what my goals are. Okay, so if you could put some money, of your own money, into getting buying someone to help you with decision making, would you do it? The vast majority said yes. <laughs> now this is lovely for research because you think it's the way you ask the question that gets a different answer. But why, why would that be? And I reckon that's because people didn't necessarily think that unless that person was an independent person who was absolutely there for them, that they wouldn't necessarily trust that it was going to be the right thing. But if they, if they paid that person themselves, then um, it was something that they... And you can, you can read the report and see the, the comments about that. So here we go. So support... With, I, I, I've obviously not been catching up with myself. So the vast majority of people said yes. So... Um, Psychosocial disability and the NDIS, what have we got? Fluctuating needs, we've got issues around poverty, um, gaps in current mainstream um, service provision, um, minimal informal supports, loneliness and isolation, the need for skilled support workers, the problems with stigma and discrimination, and the acknowledgement that people need support with decision making. And our findings are that we think that people do um, value using collaborative and participatory methods to try and have good conversations. Um, the NDIS, I think, needs to recognise the social determinants and to be cost effective um, and meet its overall objectives, it may need to continue to develop innovative ways to have these conversations. And just in summary, um, these, are the, these are our general findings. And that's it from me. Thank you. Sorry about the problems with my slides. Thanks, Lisa. We've probably got time for one or two questions if people have a burning thing they want to ask. Yep, down the front. It's not really a question. Your slides on the system are much private, so we can't download them. Yeah, that's right. That um, we'll we'll that upload there? the... the um, unfortunately, for some reason, the new one that I put up um, isn't the one that, that came up just then. Yeah. So um, I just had to take the images off because yeah. I've got a problem with the copyright on the yeah. images that are up there. So we'll ju I'll just upload the one that doesn't have images and then you'll be able to download it. So it's sorry about that. Very, it's great information. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Question down in the middle there. I think it's really good drawing out that theme of family. I did some um, course writing a couple of years ago on um, working with consumers and carers and really went looking for literature um, about families and carers 
um, in recovery owner practice. And the Scottish Recovery Network did do a really beautiful piece of research, but there really was very little about that. So I think it's also kind of a gap in the literature around recovery as well. But I do think within that time, like I think that theme of connectedness brings some stuff together and the fact that that came through really in the narrative synthesis is important. But definitely when I went looking, it was really, really hard to find literature about families. And I think um, in that Scottish recovery literature, they said that families initially struggled with the concept of recovery and what it meant. But once uh, they were exposed to it, it was really uh, empowering and interesting and hopeful for them too. Do you mind if I make a comment? Uh, I think, I think it's the, the nuance, I think, is the idea that we have to be really careful with social connection. I think I've already said this about lumping everything about relationships into one thing that's social connection. And to actually see that as um, much more complex than um, once you've got a few, few friends, then that's, that's it. Because it's, it is much more complex than that if family is still um, something you're family members of people you're still disengaged from and you're still in a, in, a, in a space where you feel that having a family of your own is just a pipe dream. One last question from the front. Yeah, it's very interesting. Do you have any plans on repeating the, the research within, in the same population, say in a year's time, and funding for that to happen? Yeah, I mean, this was always, you know, we'd hoped it would be a pilot and that we'd find other opportunities to continue the research. And I think the ideal thing would be to start looking at the degree to which what people ended up ended up getting in individualised funding packages actually matches the preferences that we heard about. Um, we've probably got opportunities to, even if we don't go back to the same participants, go back to similar participants to ask about whether there's been a mismatch or a good match between um, what they anticipated that they would like in an individualised funding environment and what they actually got. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa.